with us um, one of our own uh, buddy, uh, like Colin said, uh, my name is Mitrick. I'm also a former graduate of this fantastic uh, course, as well as uh, a participant in the HVAC course that he took. And I'm here to tell you guys about why HVAC is one of those career choices you can choose or those career paths you can have after college. So I'm gonna cover what is HVAC in construction, which is the primary source of HVAC or yeah, the primary area where you'd be working, what we do at McDonald Miller, which is the company I'm currently employed at, what is a project manager, how to be a successful project manager, why HVAC and construction, as well as project management. Because in HVAC and construction, there's a variety of jobs that our degrees are very useful with, but, but I specifically went into project management and I like it, and then ultimately how to get into HVAC, because I'm sure half of you guys are still trying to find jobs and if it makes you feel better, I did not have a job until two days after I graduated. Like, I graduated on Sunday and the following Tuesday I was given a job offer. And it took applying to a ton of companies, so hopefully with what I share today, it can at least help alleviate a little bit of your concerns. So starting off, what is HVAC in construction? Um, in construction, there are basically two sorts of branches. There's the commercial side and there's the residential side. Commercial is where we spend a lot of our focus and so that's where you have, say, a building like this one or um, a university or a government building, apartments, businesses, or like large multi-stories. That's where uh, McDonald Miller specializes in. And specifically, typically when in the HVAC industry, we're also doing plumbing systems as well. So what we call HVAC is really mechanical systems and essentially in any building, there's a variety of systems that are being used to convey air throughout the building. And in addition to that, a lot of the times these systems are designed in conjunction with plumbing uh, systems. And so a company like McDonald Miller and other large um, HVAC or design build firms will have a good amount of plumbing engineers who focus on the plumbing scope of the project and the, um, the HVAC engineers who focus on the, uh, the mechanical systems. And so um, <clears throat> with HVAC or specifically uh, air conditioning, um, there are two types of systems that we specialize in. And it's part of the reason why we do plumbing as well, but we have the air systems, which is just using air and refrigerant to cool a building or heat a building. And then we have the hydronic system, which is actually um, say like a central chiller plant where it has water at a certain constant temperature. And then it runs that water through a series of like pipes and coils. And like, for example, these chilled beams up here, these are actually run through a water system. And the reason we, they like the water system is uh, there's a lot more heat that can be carried or a lot more thermal energy capacity in water as opposed to air. And so hydronic systems are usually used for much larger scale buildings such as this one rather than like a smaller two story that is like for maybe a couple hundred employees. And then, so with HVAC in construction, it's very multifaceted. And so the typical processes start off with the design, whether it's the owner or we're designing, we're, whether we're given a design or we're designing for the owner, and then we build it, we install it, and then we start up the equipment, make sure everything's working, we commission it to make sure that it all checks out, and then we hand it over to the owner and then we service it to promote longevity. Uh, also, feel free to ask any questions or stop me at any moment. Um, we cut each other off in construction all the time, so it's, it's not an offensive thing to do. So at McDonald Miller, we're a full service design build engineering company. So essentially, we will in construction, they're MEP trades, and these are the trades that go in and install the systems that make the building work. There's the electrical, there's fire sprinkler, um, 
there's mechanical and there's plumbing. So all of these systems are what you interact with daily, whether it's you're turning on a light switch or if you're increasing the heat, decreasing the heat, uh, running a faucet or whatever. All of these systems are where we come in and we do a lot of design. And so they say that we are doing our best job when you don't notice any problems. It's only when you guys start noticing problems that we're, we you will start getting yelled at. But if you guys don't hear anything or as much as as long as your plumbing is running, we're not going to hear any complaints. Um, <clears throat> we typically focus on two types of projects. We have a design build where the owner comes to us and they have they give us a building and they're like, here, we want you to design a system for this building. And then we also have the uh, tenant or sorry, the plan spec where a design is already provided by a third party engineer and it's our job uh, to make it work. And then the other thing is we also primarily focus in new construction and tenant improvement type projects. So new construction is say uh, a completely brand new building is coming up. We will provide all the um, equipment starting from scratch, from like say the bottom all the way to the top, we'll provide the system for that. Or the other part is tenant improvement where we're going into an existing building that's old and they just want to update their equipment and make it more fresh. Um, and then, so with McDonald Miller, we are one of the top 10 largest mechanical contractors in the Pacific Northwest. There is like University Mechanical, Hermanson, and a couple other places. We all are similar in that we all work in the same industry, but all these different companies tend to specialize in certain areas. What we like to specialize in and where a lot of our revenue comes in is new construction and uh, tenant improvement. <coughs> in, at our company, we have multiple business units, which actually is really appealing because it, the di that diversity of business units makes it so we're not easily laid off because a lot of the times in construction, people will say that it's a very uh, volatile industry where you can either be hired or fired pretty quickly. With the multiple business units, it makes it so the company is not as eager to like fire people, but rather put them in other areas where they can develop more experience and then kind of bring them back to the projects when they're there. As opposed to just hiring you like other companies do and then firing you as soon as there's no longer any work that needs to be done. And then finally, a lot of roles go into making a building work. So it's a very involved process from when we bid the job to when we turn over the project to the owners. Um, there are a lot of hands that are involved in uh, where project managers come in is they typically facilitate the project from a good beginning of 10% or from the first 10% of the project all the way to the rest. So next is what is project management? Um, so like I mentioned earlier, in this industry, you can become an engineer, you can become a detailer, you can become a project manager, you can even go into sales, but I, yeah. No. Uh, I specifically focused in project management because that's what they hired me as, or they, they hired me as a project engineer and I wasn't gonna complain because I needed a job right out of college. However, I will say that having worked as a project manager for a couple of years, I've actually kind of learned to embrace it and appreciate it because I do think a lot of the skills that I've, I've learned on the job are also very self-applicable. We also like to call ourselves project meddlers because like I told Collins, uh, a lot of people tend to hate on us at the job because all we do is just get in the way of people's stuff. So with project management, um, <clears throat> there are basically four areas that we tend to focus on. And this list is not exhaustive, but rather what I have experienced. We have scope management, which is the budget, schedule, and timelines, where the main focus of any project is to be pro to, to make the client happy, but to also be profitable. So part of being profitable is being able to get the work that was bid done within schedule and within budget, because if we don't get it done within schedule, that can, one, make us look really bad, and two, cost us a lot of money, 
and within budget because, well, if your company is not making money, it's going to go under. Uh, in terms of people management, we are not people managers per se, but we have to hold people accountable. In this industry, and I'll go into this in more detail, you can't manage anybody because you're dealing with a bunch of grown men who will look at you and pretty much uh, curse you off at the job site. So you got to learn how to maintain that situation. But in most instances, or almost in all instances, we're dealing with subcontractors, general contractors who are the owners of the projects we're working on the foremen who do all the designing and the installing, and the vendors where we purchase all that equipment that we're gonna be doing the installing. And then the other part is the equipment management, which is the ordering, delivering, installing. So basically, project managers are responsible for getting the equipment to the site. We don't do the install, but we have to make it so the equipment is procured on time, on budget, and within schedule such that the equipment's usually there within a week or two prior to it being installed. Uh, that's part of the whole lean principles that have kind of taken over the industry because also storing equipment's expensive and a lot of the times you're trying to limit the amount of time spent storing because time wasted is money wasted and that's money that can't be recouped. So we're always constantly trying to work through um, not having things ordered on time, but also not having unnecessary costs incurred for just storage. And then the last thing I identified was problem management. And this is really what distinguishes a good project manager from a great project manager. So our job as project managers is basically to just solve problems as they come up. like. For example, on a typical day, and actually on the project I'm working on, I will go into work and I will not know what's going on. I'll have like my set of problems to handle, but then you'll have like five people come up to me. One person will be like, Hamid, I need this bit of information. And then I'll have a vendor call me. He'll be like, this piece is not working and uh, we need to get something reordered. And then I'll have the general contractor come to me and ask me where is some stuff that they're waiting on and then maybe my boss will come to me and ask me for something. These are the problems we can't really anticipate, but all you can do is just embrace it and work with them and try to work your way through them. But then the other problems that you can anticipate is kind of like ordering equipment and making sure you, and as you build experience, you'll get to this point where you'll be able to identify certain issues that you know will become an issue down the road that you can go ahead and take care of early on. So <clears throat> how to be a successful project manager, a lot of these are general life skills and also I'm sure a lot of these skills you guys have already learned in college. And this list is not exhaustive by any means, but a lot of these skills I've identified as what will help you grow very quickly in the company. Because in our company, it typically takes about three to five years, or it takes about five years to become a project manager. But if you're smart about it, like I was, you can do it in three. And the thing is, um, it really benefits you to do it as quickly as possible and to be on your best behavior because it's like, as you take on more responsibility and you're able to get yourself promoted quickly, you're gonna make more money. And if you guys don't want more money, then I, I don't know what to tell you. So one thing, is to always take responsibility. Um, as you get more and more experienced, you'll be able to understand better which issues are yours and which are not. Uh, but in the general sense, if something comes up that's internal to your team, you typically want to take responsibility and you don't want to blame anybody. Because if you say, this is not my problem, you're not going to get a lot of respect or, or and you'll pretty much upset a lot of people around you. But if you're like, well, you know what, let's figure something out. I don't know how to work my way through this, but we'll work something out. That goes a lot further in building your respect with the team, because when you're working with a team, your team can either empower you to succeed and make you look good because they like you, or your team can make you fail and make it so you're pretty much kicked out of the industry. However, as long as you're not a mean person or you're not condescending or you don't act like you're better than anybody, you're probably going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> And so for a lot of us, 
this was especially applicable starting off because uh, when you get into the industry, assuming you want to go into HVAC, it's important to understand that you know absolutely nothing as quickly as possible. Because as soon as you walk in there trying to strut your stuff, you're going to be knocked down very, very quickly. But if you can go in there and you can allow yourself to be laughed at, which is actually a sign of endearment, the people around you will love to tell you about what they're doing. Or if somebody asks you a question or wants you to do something, there's nothing wrong with asking follow-up questions to understand what the task is. With project management, nothing is really technical. A lot of it is just trying to understand what the ask is. Like a foreman will come to me and he'll be like, me, this grill looks off. And I'll be like, okay, so wh what do you mean the grill looks off? Like, is it left too much? Is it right too much? And so just asking up the follow-up questions will lead to the foreman being like, well, actually what we have is it's not being mounted properly and we need to look for another mounting option. So a lot of these is just on your you, on you doing your due diligence to um, do a little extra work, but it's it's not going to hurt you in the long run. Or, and actually, it will never hurt you at all. Um, the next one is to manage the project, not the people. In this industry, you're working with a lot of experts that have like over 20 to 40 years worth of experience. So like I mentioned earlier, you can try to manage these people, but they will swear at you. They might fight you because uh, the foremen are, are not the college educated, they're more of the um, street educated, but they are very intelligent people about what they do. So it's better for you to just help them out as needed and to manage the parts of the project that you need to take care of to make sure that the project does not fail. Uh, and don't have an ego. This is kind of a general rule of life because it's good to be confident and be proud of the work you do, but don't have the ego of I'm better than people or you don't know what you're talking about, I do, because like I mentioned earlier, that's going to really nosedive your career and you're barely gonna be able to take off before you even, um, before, before you've barely started your career. I've seen this enough times, even in my limited four years of experience, and I've seen how those that have the ego typically tend to not make it as far. Your company won't tell you because they'll, they'll want to hold on to you, but if you're one of the first people that they lay off during a recession or a time when companies are slowing down, that's, that's typically a sign that you're probably not it. Um, another uh, thing I noted was we are generalized and not specialized. With engineering, if you're, say, a mechanical design engineer, you're specialized in a lot of the mechanical knowledge, which is uh, kind of consisting of what this class teaches, where you learn how to design a system or how to spec a piece of equipment that's specifically designed for our climate. A lot of the work has already been done and everything is clearly defined and dictated by the code. All you're doing is making your system work within the code as well as making it so it doesn't go out of budget, which is where, again, we come back and we, we, we're, a pain in the, we're, we're a pain in the butt for people. And then this is actually a, this next note is actually kind of universal, but it's what one of the senior project managers at my company has said, but proper preparation prevents piss poor performance, or preparation prevents piss poor performance, because in this industry, there's a lot going on, and you always gotta be prepared, because what people do not like is for you to come to them last minute and say, hey, I got this problem, I need you to help me right now, because everybody has that going on. Every once in a while, a lot of the times, you won't know that this was something that needed until the day of, and you can communicate that and people are willing to accommodate, but if you do this every day, people are not going to want to help you out or they're not going to be happy. And then the other one is proper communication saves time. So. Early on in your career, uh, how many of you guys make a lot of phone calls or do you guys use email during most of the time? It's mostly email, I'd say? Yeah. 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 
uh, in construction, uh, because we're dealing with people who are like in their 50s and 60s, they don't like using email. So you're gonna have to get used to picking up the phone and making phone calls. I will tell you when I first started, I hated calling people on the phone and I was like, I feel like I'm bothering these people because man, I'm calling them and um, I don't even know what I'm asking for. But then over time, you kind of realize you can either sit there for a week waiting for an email while there are 10 other things that need to be done, or you can just get on the phone with someone for five minutes and be like, hey, I have this problem or I need this information from you. I've started doing that and at this point now I'm not even uncomfortable about calling people on the phone. Like sometimes I will call a vendor every single day if I have to, to get an answer because at the end of the day, I'm paying them for their services, so I expect a certain level of uh, performance or a certain level of ex expectations that is also the same that would be expected of me. Because if my general contractor called me and I was unavailable, or I took a long time to get them stuff, they probably let my boss know, my boss's boss and the CEO know, and it would not look very good. And then, then we're just running into a lot of problems. So. That's why a lot of these things are, like I said, universal, but also very applicable. And one thing I forgot to note, which I'm glad you mentioned at Collins, is organization. Uh, because if there's one thing I can tell you as you get uh, higher up in your career and you get more and more responsibility, <clears throat> if you're not organized, you're gonna really struggle in this industry as a project manager specifically. Because again, with so many things going on, you can't just tackle every task as it comes in. You have to learn how to prioritize certain tasks because you'll have 10 things that come in or like that scenario I mentioned earlier where there are five things or five people will call me about something. It's important to prioritize those five different tasks because everybody will say, I need something today, when in reality, some things can be held off for like a week and so you can focus on the things that need to be covered more immediately. So. Now, on to the fun part of why HVAC and project management. So this industry is actually pretty lucrative. In terms of the mechanical engineering degree, it's probably the most, if not the second most lucrative. Like, pays are on par with that of Boeing and um, pretty much any other mechanical sort of engineering industry. Lucky for us in the Pacific Northwest, we live in one of the areas where pays tend to be higher, so that just works out in our favor. Um, in terms of starting pay, you're looking at anywhere between 60 to 70K, and then mid-career, you can be anywhere between like 90 to 110K, and this is just base pay, not including bonus or any other incentives. And then as you get to like your senior and onward, so like 10 years into this industry and on, you're looking at anywhere between 150K to as much as you really want to make, depending on how much responsibility you're willing to take. In this industry, it's very high stress, but it's also very high reward. So as long as you're willing to take on more responsibility, they'll typically pay you for that responsibility. Um, there's a lot of job security in HVAC. Even though it's construction, there's a lot of job security in HVAC in our role specifically. So if you get an engineering degree, uh, you're probably never gonna be out of a job because engineers will always need be needed. There are buildings that are always going to be designed. There are people who are always going to want new buildings for their employees, and they're always gonna need engineers to design those. Even if a project may not necessarily go on, that design is still gonna need to be done, and that's where the engineers are going to be needed as well as project managers where, again, a good project manager is hard to find. And with a lot of people, they don't really like managing projects that much because it is one of the more high stress parts. But if you're able to do your job well, you'll probably never be out of a job because there's only gonna be more and more projects in the future as we kind of transition as a market towards that sort of uh, industry or that sort of skill set. And then PM skills or project management skills are, actu are actually very universal. So a lot of the stuff I'm learning in HVAC can be applicable to other industries. So like say um, I get my project management or PMP in a year or so, 
I can pretty much transition out of HVAC into any other industry that I want because I have the skills of a project manager. I may not have that exact knowledge, but the knowledge is very quick to pick up. And as you get more and more experience, you get good at learning things quickly. Um, but the skills that I've developed are the ones that are pretty much universal throughout. And then if you're someone who gets bored very easily, uh, HVAC or, well, so construction slash project management slash HVAC is not a very boring industry. Uh, maybe in the engineering side, it might be a little bit slower paced because you're working on a design, but on the non-engineering side or project management side, you really never know what's going to happen each day. Some days you'll be sitting and nothing will happen, and then other days you'll have so much work that you think your world is crumbling down on you. Uh, but even then, a lot of this is simply just working your way through it because you will realize that there are people who know a lot more than you, but they've also been in your shoes at one point. So it's okay to be overwhelmed. It's okay to be overloaded. You're just going to learn how to work through it. And as long as you don't stop working through stuff, you're going to be okay. It's like, you may feel like, oh God, I think these guys are going to fire me because I'm messing stuff up all the time. But it's like, no. The only time you really run into issues is if you don't learn from your mistakes. I mean, in my instance, I've made countless mistakes where a lot of the times if I did something better, I would have saved the company like tens of thousands of dollars. But on the flip side, I've also been proactive and I've been able to save the company hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's like, <clears throat> we always cost, or we all have ch uh, times where money will be, or where we'll make mistakes that will cost people. But at the end of the day, it's not going to kill you. And for the most part, there, it's the environment is set up such that you should be willing to learn, uh, or you should be that that learning will not be penalized. And so, lastly, how to get into this industry? Um, so, embrace this HVAC course because the first interview I did with my company. The project manager who was interviewing me was like, oh, nice, I see you have the intro to HVAC course. This is actually really good. Not a lot of our candidates have this. So that immediately set me up above the typical candidate. The other thing that a lot of um, us have here is that we all have mechanical engineering degrees. And that's also going to set you up very well in the future because a lot of the times they're looking for, they're now looking for mechanical engineers to become project managers as opposed to just project managers who are project managers because they want people who have that technical knowledge or the technical problem solving that engineers have and take those skills and utilize those with becoming project managers. In fact, uh, more just this past couple weeks, I was trying to figure out a problem uh, with insulation and I called my engineer and I was like, so I think does, does If we double the insulation on a piece of equipment, does the thermal conductivity scale linearly? And if you guys are familiar with the thermal conductivity equation, we actually use that equation in our work. And I was like, huh, wow, I actually used my college learning. So I, I, <laughs> I felt pretty proud about that. Um, with, with jobs, I have right now, because there's kind of a hiring frenzy, it should be a little bit easier to get a job out of college, but basically you just need to keep applying and applying and applying and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing. Cause I applied to like over a hundred or 200 companies, but it was only one company that needed to say, yep, we'll hire you. And that's where I came in. Um, the other one is to utilize your capstone to talk about how you offered a supportive role on the project. Uh, I did not have any professional experience getting coming into this industry and I was basically considered an outsider coming in, but I was able to leverage my capstone and say, yeah, so in my capstone, because there was only enough work for three people and there was four of us, I utilized uh, or I took care of the documentation so those three could focus on their work specifically while I'm able to help support the project on the back end so that way we're able to move forward. At the time, I didn't realize that that's what project management was, but having worked enough, I was like, wow, that was actually one of the best things I could have said. Um, next is to be prepared for the interview. Uh, 
with the entry-level position, they're not going to really ask you very technical questions. They're just going to ask you questions more about you. They want to get to know who you are, how you think, how you work, how you handle problems. And so just understanding that and knowing that those are the questions and specifically starting off, you'd be a project engineer. Knowing what questions they're going to ask and being prepared to answer those is going to help. And then the last one is send me your resume because I know we are hiring like crazy and um, our recruiter is constantly reaching out to people to, uh, yeah, go for it, don't, don't be shy. Uh, but our recruiter is constantly reaching out to people to get uh, us to send them their resumes. We are also a smaller company, so it's a little bit easier for me to reach out directly to HR and be like, hey, HR, so I have a couple kids who graduated from the same program that I did that also took an intro to HVAC course that would be interested at working at Mac Miller. Here are their resumes, and I'm pretty much good at that point. And I can at least, I can assure you that we can at least get you an interview if that's the case. So. It's not, the, it's, it's not the worst thing to do, but I can tell you that this industry has been surprisingly, uh, surprisingly good to me for someone who just graduated out of college who was like, yeah, man, I don't know what I wanna do. I just wanna make money. This, this is not a bad one for that. So any other questions or I'm done talking, so up to you guys now. You said the entry level position would be a project engineer. What does a project engineer do? What does that look like? So you basically assist the project manager with tasks. So you handle a lot of, let's just say, grunt work, where it's like you'll be creating submittal packages, which is assembling product data. You'll be writing requests for information where somebody will come to you and be like, this is not clear. You'll be handling a lot of the lower risk stuff that is uh, easier for people to handle and not as high risk. So that's, that's what they typically do. Thank you. All right, also uh, feel free to reach out to me after this as well. If you do have any follow-up questions, if you want any interview help or anything, I like to help as many people as I can because couldn't have gotten this job by myself, so it's only fair that I try to return the favor to everybody around me. So, uh, here we go. Uh, how many employees are it? Uh, I think we're at about 1,500 right now. 15, wow, that's a pretty good size. I'm kind of impressed by how many employees sometimes. Yeah. So, at your job, or I guess the, the project management position you had or the one before, um, were there any kind of like Um, for project management, you just got to be pretty familiar with Excel uh, and y your Word stuff. Uh, there's a document manager called Bluebeam, which is PDF on steroids, um, but that you'll kind of learn on the job. When it comes to the engineering design, um, you'll also learn a lot of these uh, tools on the job as well. It's really, as long as you have the curiosity to learn or the hunger to learn, the rest will kind of be given to you over time. So do you use this uh, scheduling, project scheduling tool, what is that called? The, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but the ske scheduling method is? Uh, we, are, we are subjected to the scheduling method. So the general contractor will typically come with a terrible, terrible scheduling method and we're just kind of expected to work with that and not cry too much. However, a lot of the times we can talk to them and be like, hey, this is not working or whatever. But we, because we're actually a subcontractor, we don't typically do a lot of scheduling with our own stuff. Yeah, one of my uh, colleagues, who, well, he wasn't here when, when you were here, but uh, Professor Anderson, he's really big on project management and wanting to incorporate more project and uh, he and I have been talking about how, how he does. I'm 
wondering from your perspective, is, is project management something that would be valuable to teach to students, or is it something more that you have to learn on the job? Is, did you I, feel prepared when you got into it? I think project management is, mm, I mean, you could familiarize yourself with project management terminology, like the word people love throwing around is critical path, which That's I didn't I understand thinking. until like yeah, yeah. recently. CP, yeah. yeah. So it's like, it won't hurt to familiarize yourself with terminology, but um, in terms of like, I think having the hunger and the curiosity and the skills that I learned in the program, that's what prepared me more so for the ability to take on the challenges that helped me grow into the project management role. Because the good thing is, like I mentioned earlier, when you're right out of college, they just expect that you know very little. And so the expectation is that they're going to help mold you into that project manager that they're looking for. So even if you take a couple early on courses, it's like they're still going to expect that you know very little and they're going to approach you that way. My, that's more the engineers. We usually come in from time to time when like there are small requests. So for example, like the insulating the equipment situation, that's where I had to figure out which code dictated how the equipment was insulated. So like I'll maybe do onesie twosie stuff but for the most part, my role does not center on dealing with code. It just centers more on people-esque problems. So somebody comes to me with an issue and I have to help them solve it. Yeah, the question I always have to ask is, uh, what, 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 you know, if you, if, you, if you were to design your own HVAC class that would prepare students you know, for what you, have to do what you see your colleagues doing. What what are the main things you would want to, students to learn in that class? I think I, I've actually thought about this, so this is good. I'm glad you asked. Um, knowing more about the mechanical equipment um, that is used to convey air, so like understanding how a chilled water system works, um, how an air handling unit works, um, also possibly incorporating a bit of plumbing in it. Because plumbing is not as complicated, but the more information you can have that makes it easier for the company to not have to like have as much of a runway, the better it would be. So I'm thinking more like general knowledge of systems, of mechanical and plumbing systems that are used. That's what I'd add for a HVAC project manager specifically. I mean, maybe construction terms and HVAC terms, but again, that's kind of more jargon based and it's gonna be learned on the job, but the knowing the systems ahead of time and how they work and just having like a high level idea of how they work will also help you out when you hear people dropping heat pumps or chilled water, or like heating hot water, all these things, you'll be like, okay, well, a, if it's a chilled water system, there's probably a main pump somewhere in a distribution area or like a building and that pump is what's conveying the cold water that goes throughout that that's going through a cold water loop and that loop has multiple branches that's serving all of these pieces of equipment that run off of that cold water or not run off of it but use that cold water to convey conditioned air into space so it's very generalized if i were if for for my sort of teaching i guess that's good to know Yeah, I know when, uh, in taking the, the PE exam in each fact, um, I was surprised, and I think a lot of people who take it are surprised by how much equipment knowledge. And uh, so I, I had to, uh, you know, there's four volumes to the Asherite handbook. You know, there's fundamentals, which is what we mostly cover in intro classes, psychometrics and heat transfer and things like that. Then there's an applications. So, you know, what, how do you design 
a system for a hospital or for a hotel, uh, there's a separate refrigeration plant. So if you're going into refrigeration, then there's a systems and equipment plant. And that deals with a very specific set of you know, valves, centrifugal pumps, <laughs> and opens them up, schematics of what they look like inside, all the parts. And that's something that we tend not to do in the intro class so much. If you, you actually really need to have a teardown of some pieces of equipment to see how they work. And uh, that's where I really had to come up with speed. Um, and I think that was the book. Now, I took it at the time when you, you had to bring all these books with you. Now it's, everything's on a computer. You can't bring your own books. But I used that systems, it, that systems and equipment book the most. And I'm glad I spent time working through that. Yeah. Yep. Just a valve. You think of a valve. But there's know, like different types tens of valves, of valves out there. Control valves. How they work, and, and you know, double acting valves, and you know, you know, fail open, fail closed solenoids, and you know, it's just the kind of stuff that you don't really learn in a classroom. And I'd say you don't appreciate it until your system starts to fail. Because, uh, like, right now, when you guys are using the bathroom, or if you use the heater in your home, you're like, ah, everything works, everything's good, but as soon as a leak hits, or your furnace stops working, that's where like you start getting upset. And that's typically what we like to avoid in our industry. Essentially, if we're doing our job well, you're not even gonna notice it. Cause it's like, there's an immense amount of engineering, like millions of dollars of engineering that goes into just making sure that, for example, the faucet back there will not leak because they used a certain type of angle stop that is less prone to leaking or the joining method that is being used behind the wall is um, it's soldered and sort of instead of pressing or instead of like what is now more often used packs. So a lot of these things it's, um, and this is actually one thing I did forget to mention, the, this industry is very like personally applicable. So a lot of the stuff you learn in this industry, you can also really utilize in your own home. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. I, I have a water hammer problem in my plumbing. I, I can't solve it. I've tried everything. And water hammer is a serious problem. We should have talked about it in this class. I, 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 I don't know why I don't have an issue with this. You know, when you get pressure waves moving through your pipes, pressure waves move the key to sound. And uh, they can do a lot of damage. And they can, they're really hard to, you, know, you need to design with the, the goal of avoiding water hammer. And there's ways that you can, you can do that. Once you get it, it's a tough one. It's a tough problem. Do you have an external water hammer? Like a attachment, or is it just um because I know they can like actually add a water hammer to your system to help in the area where it's incurring yeah, that. that. That's the problem is I can't I don't have access to where I can't seem to get access <laughs> to where, where it's located. It happened after some presentation. In the air flows in the system. When we had a new HVAC system installed last summer, they put the system into the, the existing ductwork, and there's serious pressure imbalances. How do, how do you, 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 you do that? You control that with the dampers, but you have to be able to access the dampers as well. You control it, but I can't access the dampers easily. But then, yeah, these are things that you know, just from what we've learned in this class, you, know, you can go and look at your own plumbing system and start. And this is just so basic, you know, it's not high tech at all. And it's just amazing how the, the, the intense engineering and physics involved, even in these very basic kinds of, we take for granted air moving around and water moving around. It's, yeah, it's, it's there's complicated. nothing, and well, in this industry, you're not really designing anything new. You're more or less designing new ways to convey air around the building. That's all you're doing. You're not designing new equipment or um, new pumps, or you're not like focused too much on the nitty gritty. You're typically just specking out existing equipment there. Yeah, absolutely. So things that I learned in the 1980s when I was working in the field are as applicable today as they were then. Yeah. We might use some computer software to help in the design, but centrifugal pumps 
now. You know, axial fans, pretty much the same. We had variable speed drives then, they were just a lot more expensive and rare. Now they're cheap everywhere. And like you said, pretty much used on almost all the pumps <coughs> that are out there. Yeah. Because yeah. energy is also a very big thing, and you want to limit the energy you're consuming because energy consumption is cost. So it's like you, it's it, it's crazy or immense the amount of time and like energy that's spent into making it so some system doesn't run too hot, otherwise it's gonna consume two dollars more than it needs to when it could have been consuming two dollars less. It's like it's absurd how infinitesimal everything is, but it's also kind of like an appreciation because it's it's basically calculus in human form more or less without as much headache or tears. All right, well, are we, any other last questions or? You guys got the email if needed. You could just, uh, I'll send you my email so you could share it with the class in case any other people have questions. But like I said, if you're looking for a job, send me your resume and I'll at least try to get you an interview. I put a link in the materials for today. Um, there's a link to Hamid's uh, LinkedIn page, so you can go. Not too. You open the connections. If you oh yeah, connect. most definitely. Um, like I said, I I remember being in your guys' position and being stressed about not having a job, and it's not fun. So if I can help, let me know how I can help, and I'm happy to give some of my time to help you guys out. So that way. You can help future people out and so on and so forth because uh, we could always do with more people in this industry and like i said earlier on it it pays well enough that you can uh, pretty much afford one hobby you like very well so if you like cars you'll be able to afford cars in this industry what's your hobby cars cars <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm actually saving up for another car because I did buy a house recently and I did have a fun car but I rolled it so I had to buy a not as fun car in the meantime while I wait to get my next fun car like next year possibly. What, what cars do you like? A golf car. Uh, fast cars basically. Anything that's fast. <laughs> it's fast. Yeah because I am so to, to kind of put into perspective I am trying to get a GTR like in a two, three year time frame. And this industry it pays enough to be able to afford cars like this. Cause like if you're making say mid career, five years down the road, you're making like 120K a year. If you're smart with your money, you can pretty much buy whichever car you want. Maybe not a Lamborghini, but like a BMW or something that's in the 50 to 100K range, you could probably swing that with this industry. So yeah, I like fast cars. Yeah, if you can find a 68 uh, Camaro, that's what I want. I, for like a good half year, I wanted to buy a Mustang GT. But I talked to some people and they're like, don't use that as a daily tractor. You're just going to cry. Like I put gas in it every two days. I was like, Damn. all right, fine. I'll, I'll settle with a turbocharged 400 horsepower car instead. I'll be more sensible. Yeah, I told my wife she gets 